Hi everyone, Dan Vokins from Neff here. I'm one of the guests on this week's special weekly economics podcast on Ecuador. We delayed releasing the podcast because of the earthquake in Ecuador, and since then there have been hundreds of follow-up tremors, the biggest reaching 6.2 on the Richter scale. We know that over 600 people so far have lost their lives, with many more missing. Vital infrastructure and equipment has been destroyed, including thousands of buildings. Now, we've decided to go ahead with releasing the podcast this week, but we ask listeners, if you can, to please donate to earthquake recovery efforts in Ecuador right now to help buy essentials and fund the rebuilding project. We've put a list of places to donate in the description to this podcast, wherever you get it from, so please check that after you've listened to give a donation to help. Thank you. This government is basically an economist government and it happens that most of us are heterodox economists. I don't know if you can find so many heterodox economists in one government. What the Ecuadorian example shows is that austerity doesn't have to be the way. Hello, my name is Kirsty Styles, and welcome to a very special weekly economics podcast. Everybody knew that Ecuador was going to change, that it was serious this time. This week, it's the first of our weekly economics podcast stories, taking a deeper look into something a bit special that's caught our eye. Uh, there was a, a, a police mutiny and then a coup. There was a shootout. He was almost killed. What's really going on in Ecuador is a battle for power, really. Today we're talking about Ecuador, the little country in Latin America that's doing things a little bit differently. To find out more, Dan Vokins from the New Economics Foundation and Jackie Howard from Compass popped over there on an economics nerd holiday. Hello, Dan, Jackie. Hello. Hello. So, you went to Ecuador before Christmas. Sounds incredible. What were you up to there? Yeah, so basically we were on holiday out there and it is this uh, tropical paradise. Everyone's obviously heard of the Galapagos Islands, um, but they've also got the Himalayas there and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, um, yeah, we went out there for three and a half weeks they to def- uh, They out. definitely don't have the Himalayas oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were also there on an important economics nerd mission, right? Okay, we met up with loads of government ministers, activists and campaigners um, to talk about what's happened in Ecuador over the last 10 years. Yeah, I mean, basically, both of us, um, besides liking the uh, the jungle, the Himalayas and the Galapagos, um, <laughs> are actually, uh, you know, economics geeks. And we'd heard that there was some pretty interesting stuff going on um, in Ecuador. So we actually wanted to go out also uh, to find out what was going on there, because that's how we get our kicks. I love that that's what <laughs> people do for fun. <laughs> Um, so before we get into all that, I know almost zero things about Ecuador, um, apart from kind of vaguely where it is. Um, what was it like? Um, it's an absolutely beautiful country. It's in the north of Latin America on the west coast. Um, tiny, about the size of the UK, but with a population of 15 million people. And it's got three really distinct regions, well actually four if you include the Galapagos. So it's got the mountain regions, the jungle, the coast and the Galapagos. And we uh, we learnt loads, so we um, spent quite a long time in the jungle and we had a guide whose name is Hiranyo and he had an amazing knowledge about not only sort of Ecuadorian history and politics, but about jungle plants and animals and basically everything in the jungle is trying to kill you. So once again, welcome to Amazon rainforest, all right? It's not allowed to swim in this area because there is uh, one of our aggressive fish, the piranha. So, I mean, it's this incredibly special place where you've got like higher biodiversity than almost anywhere else in the world. And, uh, you know, as Jackie's saying, there are all these different plants there, you know, some that are like used for different types of medicine, some that are used for um, like building of different materials and, and some as contraceptives. Which, as contraceptives mm-hmm. also. Yeah. yeah. Jungle rose. Oh, wow. Yeah. This jungle rose, the local people use a lot like um, contraceptive. For example, most of the people know like a lady's tree. 
There was also one that, like a drink that you can take after you've just had a baby to stop you from getting pregnant again and would stop you from getting pregnant for two years. As soon as they, after one week birthday, um, they drink. You don't gonna have any baby for two years. We didn't test it out. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So yeah, Hiranio also knew a lot about the history of Ecuador. So Hiranio introduced us to one of the uh, community leaders called Asavio. He had been working in the oil fields his whole life and um, was responsible for negotiating contracts for the local communities with the oil companies. Um, and he told us about um, the history of Ecuador. And basically, it's a country that's been a colony for 500 years, first by Peru and then a Spanish colony, um, and gained independence in sort of 1830. And since then, has been just complete sort of economic and social uh, chaos with military juntas, dictatorships, coups. His father generation, it was like a lot of Spain people actually who were sitting in this area, who were colonized, and then they were taking a piece of land, they were taking a big land and then anywhere, and then they were using the indigenous people like slaves to work for them. Wow, so you've got colonialism, juntas, coups, dictators, certainly not an ideal setting to build a thriving nation. So you got an introduction uh, to Ecuadorian history in the jungle. Uh, did the stories Hiranio and Asavio tell you match up with what other people in Ecuador told you? So after we left the jungle, we came back to the capital city, Quito, which is kind of the, the, the highest capital city in the world. And we met with about 10 or 15 different government ministers and people from different social movements and asked them what was going on in Ecuador in its more recent past and to try and understand some of what we'd started to see in the jungle. Between 1996 and 2006, uh, there was no president elect that actually ended its term. So that's pretty, pretty rough. We had eight presidents in 10 years. What was Ecuador like sort of eight years ago? I would say chaos, in the sense that there was political chaos, there was an economical chaos also. We have the, the really strong financial crisis in 1999. Complete chaos. Uh, two million migrants leaving the country in a period of five years out of 16 million inhabitants. Uh, this is a huge proportion. It smells of failed state. Okay, not failed state in the Somali or in the Iraqi or the you know, Afghani way, or, uh, uh, because it, it wasn't accompanied by massive violence or genocide or war, but it was certainly a failed state in which people had no pride in being an Ecuadorian, people didn't believe in Ecuador, and people didn't even have faith in democracy, which is really worrying, because when people don't have faith in democracy, people start favoring radical outcomes and anti-democratic outcomes, as happened in the past in many Latin American countries when people stop having faith in democracy, danger is looming. So what was going wrong in Ecuador at that time? So quite a lot. They um, So we're talking about the period from sort of mid-1990s onwards and um, you had a situation where so sort of economy was in the control of big businesses and oil companies from outside of Ecuador and in the control of oligarchs and big elites. Um, poverty was at sort of 45% by the year 2000, growing inequality, growing unemployment and a bunch of presidents over 10 years. So there was just sort of huge political and economic um, turmoil. So what do you think the underlying causes were to all of these problems? So you have this 500-year history of colonialism, which is still being felt today. And on top of that, more recently, over the last 20 years, you've had neoliberalism really come onto the scene. So a strong belief in free markets above all else, uh, a state that's not going to intervene in markets. And so you saw these very big 
oligarchs, very big um, fluctuations in what was going on in the market. So then intervening into all of this, you get the IMF that comes to try and help bail out the country, but also impose some really strict conditions on how the country should run, essentially. And Eduardo, who's a, sort of a key activist in, in Quito, the capital, met up with us to tell us a little bit about what that meant. Uh, my name is Eduardo Meneses. I am part of the Popular University, a social organization here in Ecuador. We didn't have sovereign, sovereignty in this country. It was the EMF. They came each two years and they say, OK, the program for the government from the next two years will be this if you want us to continue giving you some loans. But everything was privatized. And on top of that, it wasn't just that the IMF was telling everyone what to do, but also you had this, this, uh, this really big moment in the history of Ecuador where they lost their currency and they dollarized, essentially. The crisis was perceived to be so big that they switched for the American dollar. And with that, you lose a lot of control over your economy over the kind of levers that you've got to make big changes. It got a lot worse before it got better. Andres Arauz, Minister of Knowledge and Human Talent, told us what it was like in the 90s and early 2000s in Ecuador. Uh, we had uh, two decades of what we called the long and sad neoliberal night. Uh, the main uh, weakness of our society was lack of hope, lack of strength to face the future. At the same time, there was a constant search of Ecuadorian society for a change, uh, looking for uh, populist and messianical figures to try to save them from this uh, dark uh, neoliberal night. Uh, however, uh, most politicians that uh, people hoped would uh, save them in terms of the, 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 the politics and changing the, the political economy of, of our society, uh, were traitors. And it's hard to imagine quite what this must have been like to be there with this huge soaring inequality, massive levels of poverty. I mean, you had nearly two million people leaving the country, you know, leaving to go and try and make, uh, make, their, make their lives in, in, in Europe, in the USA, in all sorts of places. So, I mean, it was, it was really serious and lots of people gave up hope at that time. Lots of people left the country um, and there was a feeling that they'd tried everything. So there was kind of this despondency, as, as we heard earlier, a little bit like um, like like Ecuador was becoming a failed state almost. The, the, the common feeling of a Korean society at large was uh, fuera uh, todos, which means everybody out, all the politicians out. It was very anarchical in that sense. So how did they get out of this position of what sounds like, you know, total despair? Well, the biggest name in Ecuadorian politics of the last decade is an economist called Rafael Correa. Una nueva historia comenzado. Una historia de dignidad, de soberanía, de justicia. Correa was the finance minister in the previous government and he'd come out with a bunch of populist policies but he really came into the public eye when he was negotiating with the IMF and he quite famously came out and, uh, and said that the IMF was trying to take away the sovereignty of the Ecuadorian state and so he resigned his position and he was very quickly kind of seen as a bit of a leader in terms of uh, being an honourable politician and standing up to the economic forces that had caused all this chaos and very quickly that kind of movement started to snowball and uh, a bunch of other kind of geeky progressive economists started to get wrapped up in this whole thing and it became a bit of a movement quite quickly. <laughs> okay I mean I love a good geek. Who are these economist nerds? So they're heterodox or otherwise known as progressive economists and all those people who had emigrated to the UK and to Spain and all sorts of other places who'd gone and studied economics in a lot of cases came back to Ecuador and they surrounded and, and formed part of this uh, government. And actually Andres uh, Arauz, who we talked about before, is, uh, is kind of interesting because he's almost the same age as you and I, right? He's kind of about 30. He's this young, progressive politician and, and, and he's a heterodox economist. <laughs> This government is basically an economist's government and 
it happens that most of us are heterodox economists. I don't know if you can find so many heterodox economists in one government. So how did these economist nerds go on to win an election? I'm sure they were all, you know, super smart. But how did they make themselves electable? There was political chaos, a financial crisis. And after Korea left the government in protest to the government sort of negotiating with the IMF, um, he won huge popular support. So off the back of that, he formed Alianza País, which is the governing body at the moment and is made up of social movements and political forces in Ecuador. And within a year, won the national election with over 56% um, of the vote. So the mood of the country completely changed. And you really heard this from everyone, this kind of monumental moment when they uh, when they got elected. It was like a kind of, uh, the way people talked about it, it was like a being able to breathe again almost. What's more important than the day of, of the elect- electoral victory was the day after. Here in Ecuador we have elections on Sundays. And that Monday I clearly remember people going to work and all of a sudden the entire city didn't beep. Like here in Ecuador, uh, and when there's traffic, people are frustrated, they start honking their, their horns and beeping and beep, beep and lots of noise in the street. And that Monday, nobody, nobody honked their horns, nobody beeped. And, and, and during the traffic, uh, people would say, no, please go ahead, go ahead. And uh, they would yield the, uh, to, other, to other vehicles. And for me, that was such, a, such an extraordinary feeling. It was like everybody's mood all of a sudden changed from one day to the, to the next. And people, everybody, opposition, the right wing, everybody knew that Ecuador was going to change, that it was serious this time. So Korea's government came in on a wave of hope swept in by geeky economists. But as as we know, Ecuador has changed governments many times before. Was this time any different? Yes, um, but they started in a place you might not expect. They started by rewriting the constitution. Ecuador has had loads of constitutions, but this one was different because it was a way of having a debate about what the country was for. First off, it was written by citizens. There were consultations held across the country and with all the different interest groups in Ecuador. And second, it all boiled down to one core concept, buen vivir which literally translated means good living. For the public good, right? For when we win, for society at large. Yeah. Uh, this is an indigenous concept that basically means that the purpose of the state and the economy is to benefit the people, to make sure that they can live a fulfilled and dignified and happy life. And in the end, they put it to a vote, staking everything on this one moment on a referendum. And that referendum succeeded. We talked to Guillaume Long, um, the international spokesperson for the governing Alianza Pais, about this. And by October 2008, so uh, almost two years after his election, we had a new constitution with new rules of the game that went against neoliberalism. So those first few years uh, were, were extremely, were extremely, uh, really beautiful years. So if reforming the constitution was supposed to allow them to take on neoliberalism, how did that actually work in practice? So first they had to raise the money, and they did that in three big ways. First, they renegotiated the debts they owed, two, they boosted the tax take, and three, they changed the oil deals. The debt was arguably the biggest issue, as Andres Chiraborga, who's an economic advisor at Senplads, which is kind of like the Ecuadorian uh, treasury told us about. Um, Ecuador's debt was uh, interfering in domestic affairs of the country, undermining the country's sovereignty. There was a lot of problems with that debt. So based on those findings, the Ecuadorian government said, we are not very clear on how legitimate 
our properties that is. So we 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 won't we are not necessarily committed to pay that debt and those interests. And this debt was having a crippling effect on the Ecuadorian government and its ability to buy basic goods and services for people and 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 run its business. So they 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 had to restructure this debt in essence. And there were three main ways they did that. First off, they paired with a, a European NGO to look at all these different debts that they had, which were legitimate, which weren't. So Ecuador said, whoever was holding that debt, we have enough reasons not to pay this debt because this is illegal and it goes against the principles. So what we're going to do is, uh, instead of not paying, we're going to renegotiate. So they went to those creditors and said, you know, these debts are illegitimate for these reasons. So whoever was holding these debts were put against the wall, in a sense. And they managed to renegotiate the rates on those. But there was a second thing as well. They also went and renegotiated with the IMF. So if you remember, Correa had made his name by resigning from the previous government over a deal with the IMF. This time he went in with the full muscle and renegotiated it. Finally, they also, during the sort of 2008 economic crash, when the, the stock markets were down, they went back to Wall Street and they actually bought back their government's own debts at much, much lower rates. We managed to buy back um, $3,200 million in debt for an actual value of $900. Obviously there he means $900 million. Which is savings of around 65, 70%. Which is uh, an absolutely massive thing to have done. Just because we said, okay, this debt is illegal and we have no reasons not to pay it. But we want, well, but we actually want to pay it. But we're gonna, we're gonna have to renegotiate. And, and the total of these three measures was essentially to see about $8 billion actually repatriated back into the Ecuadorian economy. So you said dealing with Ecuador's national debts wasn't the only way that they raised money. What did they do about taxes? So many of the ministers we spoke to were quite upfront about the fact that they wanted to increase their tax intake. Many, many uh, governments, when they've gone through commodities bonanza, particularly in the third world, have actually reduced taxes. Said, oh, we don't need taxes anymore, we've got an oil boom. Well, what we did was the exact reverse. They did raise income tax, um, but very marginally, and um, actually only for richer people. The main way they boosted their tax take was by cutting down on tax evasion for big corporations and businesses, but also checking that smaller um, Ecuadorian businesses and local shops were paying their taxes. Just to give you broad figures, in 2006, uh, tax collection in Ecuador was 3 billion roughly a year. By 2014, last year, which is the, the, the figures we have, we were on 14 billion. Now, there are not a lot of countries in the world that have gone from 3 billion to 14 billion in uh, eight years' time uh, without significantly raising taxes. So we heard mention of an oil boom there. Did oil money play a big role uh, in all of this? So there's a there's quite a lot of oil in Ecuador. Um, but previously, before the renegotiation, the vast majority of money off every barrel of oil pumped in Ecuador left the country, something like 75%. Under the new arrangements, that has pretty much reversed. So now oil companies are paid a small amount or a small charge for every barrel of oil that they bring out, and the rest stays in the country. Secretary for Poverty Eradication, Andres Medeiros. If you look at oil production, uh, before uh, mo most part of the resources that has been were created uh, was taken by the by international companies and taking the money out of the country. Uh, the government changed that uh, those contracts and now most of the wealth stay in the country and the government used that money to create new schools, new healthcare facilities, new roads, uh, new access to electricity and other kinds of stuff. So basically that's how change, uh, life of people is changing. Now they do have better opportunities and that makes the whole difference. can't help but notice that you only spoke to men in this episode. Does the government have a problem with women? Fair cop. Um, most of our connections out there were um, through male friends and colleagues who we reached out to. Um, but in fact, the, the parliament is itself 42% made up of women. And we, we should have tried harder on that one. They've got binders full of women over in Ecuador, obviously, Dan. <laughs> 
try try better yep. harder next time. <laughs> <laughs> So after doing all that work, raising money by renegotiating debt, bringing in more taxes and and oil revenues, how did they go about spending it? So they basically spent most of the money on two big things, on tackling poverty and restructuring the economy. And through a range of different measures, they've actually managed to have the fastest dropping in equality and poverty in Latin America. And so they've, they've built hospitals, they've built roads connecting up sort of rural areas to the cities, they've built schools and universities, they've improved sanitation, um, sort of mass housing developments, they've improved infrastructure massively. Okay, so let's just focus on the first one, poverty reduction. What did they actually do? So one of the big things was wages. They introduced their version of the living wage. And we went to SENPLAD, which is the the ministry responsible for um, getting rid of poverty, essentially, to talk about how they've gone about doing it. Our version of the living wage. Yeah, we can definitely call it dignified wage or what we call Spanish term would be salario digno. So the core question here is, what do you do about a problem like low salaries? You know, on the one hand, you have companies threatening to leave the country, wringing their hands about how they'll become unprofitable. And on the other, obviously, you want to raise the rights of workers. So the answer, essentially, that Ecuador came to was to basically call the companies bluff. They say, OK, companies have to pay the living wage, but only if they're profitable. If you're not profitable, don't worry, you don't have to pay the living wage. Now, it turns out in that situation, companies stay, wages go up and the sky doesn't fall in. And what you get off the back of that over the the coming years is one of the lowest unemployment rates in Latin America. And now that they proved it can work, the dignified wage actually became the legal minimum wage, and it's the highest minimum wage across the continent. But it wasn't just about poverty reduction and improving wages. There was also a lot more about tackling inequality. They were interested in tackling inequality long term, and how do you do that? So first off, you educate people. So they invested in education and made it free all the way from childcare to university. And this was Guillaume Long's favourite policy. And in his previous job as Minister for Human Talent and Knowledge, he was responsible for implementing it. We've built, we've built so far 80 mega, I mean, and, and the word mega is important, huge, large-scale schools that didn't exist before. Uh, and we're probably going to complete 200 by the end of this government. These are schools that have 3,000 students that are in rural areas or in very precarious areas, uh, and they, they, they will mean a 20 to 25 point increase in kids going to secondary school, finishing their secondary school. That, that's huge. You know, but they also realised that um, poorer children couldn't concentrate at school, so they brought in things like free school breakfasts and dinners and milk and made everything else at school free as well, so that children weren't just attending school, but they could also take in the knowledge. School uniforms for free, school books for free. All school books, all school uniforms are absolutely for free. And that that's, was one of the major incentives. You could build all the, schools, all the schools in the world you wanted, but if parents who were very poor had to pay for the school uniforms, for the books, for the this, for the that, you know, the kids weren't actually going to go and attend. So that's one of the policies I really like. And the list goes on and on. So you've got free health care with massive new hospitals, doctors and nurses free at the point of use. You have the state pension being rolled out to one and a half million people who are looking after people at home. You have over 90% of electricity coming from renewables by next year. I mean, these are really big things that are happening, massive investment. And you kind of see that as the opposite of the austerity policies we're pursuing in the UK at the moment. You can have growth, you can have sustainability uh, without austerity. What the Ecuadorian example shows is that austerity doesn't have to be the way. So what effect has all of this had on the country? So you drive around and you really do see the impact that all of this has had. Um, It's still a poor country and you can definitely see that. But you also see how much is being built and invested. There are sort of quite funny signs everywhere saying the citizens' revolution has financed this next to bridges and roads and hospitals and schools. 
Um, but it is genuinely impressive. It feels like you're at the beginning of something rather than like you are in the UK at the moment where it feels like we're just trying to stop our next hospital from closing down. But was this all kind of good old fashioned tax and spend economics, uh, plus obviously some debt renegotiation and oil money thrown in, or did they do anything else to change the country? So the the geeky economists that we were talking about earlier before have this favourite phrase of theirs. It's called uh, changing the matrix of production. And essentially what they're trying to do is move away from um, a a low to middle income country reliant on oil, shrimp, bananas, that kind of stuff, to uh, a higher wage economy. So they're investing massively in new technologies and that kind of thing to try and boost the, the value of wages. But they've also done some other things as well, which you might not quite expect. So they took back control of the central bank again to, to, to guide the money supply in the economy. They introduce capital controls, which allow you to decide what money comes in and what leaves. Um, but perhaps sort of more than all of that, Andres Chiriborga was telling us about how they reformed their banking system to learn some of the lessons from the 2008 crisis that arguably we haven't learned uh, here yet. Around the world and think about the the crisis that we had in 2008 in the United States, in Europe, uh, here in Ecuador, we our law prohibits uh, commercial banking to be mixed with investment banking. So we make sure uh, there's not this contamination that has, uh, in a sense, explained financial crisis in other parts of the world. Uh, we have So we've heard a lot about the government. What does the opposition look like in Ecuador? Um, so these are really big changes we're talking about. We're talking about who owns what, how to redistribute wealth and how to run a country. And... Like any country, there are loads of opposition parties, both to the right and left um, of the Alianza País, which is the ruling party. And there's also, for instance, a trade union called the FUT, who are opposed to the government. Along sort of thinking about this, there are two main sort of opposition groups who have been behind the biggest protests in Ecuador. And these are the richer people who are primarily from the south of the country and who control most of the media and bigger industry in Ecuador. And the other is sections of the indigenous community. So um, the richer people who tend to be from the right um, are frustrated about redistribution of wealth measures, which they think will lead to economic downturn. One of the reasons is that they believe in a more neoliberal economic approach, so minimum state intervention and freer markets. The other main opposition um, comes from some of the indigenous communities who are opposed to drilling and mining in in the Yasuni. And there's also a battle around what languages and qualifications teachers need um, to be able to teach in schools. Also, protests have ebbed and flowed. And as we've already said, Ecuador has quite a tumultuous history with coups and all sorts of things. And this has continued in Rafael Correa's time. For instance, in 2010, the opposition was organising quite forcefully and this escalated when Correa was kidnapped by the police. Well, on the 30th of September 2010, uh, there was a, a, a police mutiny and then a coup. Uh, the, uh, our president was... Uh, the word, exact word isn't kidnapped because he wasn't in the hands of the opposition but he couldn't, he was in a hospital with his security, he couldn't get out he was surrounded by the police forces uh, there was a shootout he was almost killed uh, and for 12 hours uh, he couldn't get out and we, we didn't and so, the, so the Ecuadorians went to this hospital en masse and there were demonstrations everywhere in Ecuador uh, against the coup and eventually uh, it was the Ecuadorian masses that uh, won out. There was a, 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 the, the president was, was, was rescued and, and returned to the presidency. Um, wow, that's um, an unexpected twist. Is there still that level of opposition? Well, firstly, it's important to note that when the president was kidnapped, um, that there were massive protests on the streets um, that kept Korea in power after this attempt to get rid of him. And yes, there there is still opposition. So the last big protests were over the summer last year. Demonstrators have taken to the streets of Ecuador to protest the president's moves to seek a fourth term. 
The two big debates were around the constitution. So basically, should a president be allowed to stand for more than two terms of four years? We demand the National Assembly eliminate the constitutional amendments. They're reforming the constitution to guarantee Correa's indefinite re-election. And around some of the inheritance tax and land value tax reforms, the presidential change was actually passed by the Ecuadorian National Assembly, but the inheritance and land value tax reforms have been held back for the moment uh, due to quite strong opposition. Um, so another thing worth mentioning is criticism around press freedom. There are lots of critical newspapers and broadcast outlets and there is controversy around the government suing journalists for what they say is inaccurate reporting. Government supporters, on the other hand, say that they're holding private interest in the media to account and promoting more balanced journalism, but press uh, monitors disagree. Ultimately, though, clearly large parts of the population are still supportive of Korea's project, even lots of uh, indigenous groups, as they continue to win the local and national elections. The kind of changes that we're talking about here, who owns different bits of the country, where does money reside, how does it work, these are all huge questions, and they don't go down lightly with existing power or with different groups. So what you have is a real contestation in the country, to some extent, about what kind of country should this look like. And what about the fact that a lot of this social reform was funded by oil? Isn't that bad news for climate change activists? I find this one really difficult as an environmentalist myself. I mean, Ecuador essentially has this uh, sort of really sort of poor base that it's starting from. You know, people are earning really low wages if they have a job at all. So the question is, how are you going to get people out of that? Now... Either you do that through paying very low wages or you try and take some of the, the the money that you can get from pulling out raw resources and you invest that in the kind of infrastructure that, that Ecuador is. Now, that's a really challenging thing to decide what to do because there's no correct answer to, to, to that story. Now, in some ways for me as an environmentalist, I would say the most important question here is a more global one. It's how are we going to leave the oil in the ground? How are we going to leave these resources in the ground? Now, there's a special area area of, um, of Ecuador called the Asuni, which is um, right next to where uh, Asavio and Haranio that we, that we heard earlier, right next to where they live. And the government um, made a proposal to the international community. It said that we'll leave this oil under the ground if you pay half the cost of what it was worth. So we'll forgo half the revenue that we could very easily make off this oil if you pay us the other half. Now that, for me, feels like the kind of way that we need to be moving forward. But of course, the international community didn't stump up. Um, the other thing that I'd say, I suppose, here is that that money that has come out from the oil that's that's been extracted has gone into making an electricity system, which by next year is going to be more than 90% renewable. It's bought people new electric cookers so that they're not using polluting kind of stoves. It's paid for LED lights. I mean, it's done really interesting things. So for me, I would actually argue that this is more difficult than it looks when you, when you first hear about it. And the government has an uneasy relationship with oil in that respect, because ultimately, it's it's looking to do right by the people for it. So first of all, can I get you to say your name and what you do? And we spoke to sort of the journalist and researcher Lee Brown, who's based in Ecuador and studying the country's transformation. And he said that, you know, Ecuador is using the oil money to go beyond oil. And they want to have an in, a different specialisation. At the moment, they specialise in shrimps and um, oil and bananas, and they would much rather specialise in biotechnologies. So they're creating a huge um, university in the Amazon, which they're hoping will become a global centre of excellence for biotechnologies. So this is using the oil money, but to go beyond oil, which for some... So does like that, that mean they are drilling in the Yasuni then? Uh, has there been opposition to that? Uh, yes. So there are currently test sites being drilled in the Yasuni. Um, they're covering about one one thousandth of the total area. But there's still resistance to this. And the dynamics around this kind of thing are obviously incredibly complicated. So there are large disagreements between neighbouring interest groups in Ecuador, including within some of the indigenous communities, about whether or not to mine or, or drill the oil at all because of the resources it's got. But also on the other side, the, uh, you know, the, the destruction of the natural habitat that comes from this.
And this is a really long-term problem. Uh, the conflicts are often deeper than the current ones over drilling in just particularly the Sunni. And over the last 20 years, there have been, you know, it's got as serious as killings and deaths that span these complex conflicts uh, between indigenous groups, corporations, and the government. And, and these conflicts haven't stopped under Korea. So given that this is an economics podcast, what's the outlook for the Ecuadorian economy today? So right now you've got a low oil price, which is hurting all oil producing countries uh, across the region and around the world. But also uh, the only main refinery, which is currently being upgraded in Ecuador, which helps essentially get more value per barrel of oil uh, extracted, that's offline as well. And you have a a less favourable exchange rate right now. So Ecuador is still based on the dollar and the weak exchange is, is not so good for the economy right now then added to all of that you've also had as i'm I'm sure many listeners heard um uh you've just had a really big earthquake in ecuador in fact the biggest for the last 40 years and at the time of recording at least 350 people have died but we don't know the full extent of what that means right now so they've had they've had a lot of difficulties in in the last couple of years and then to, to add to all of that, the president, um, Correa, has decided not to seek a third term in, in office, despite actually having just won those constitutional reforms. If you take a step back and you sort of look at what's happened in Ecuador over the last nine to ten years and you ask the question, like, has all this worked? Um, then the answer is yes, I mean, it has. So you're really starting to see the gains of the economic policies that have been put into place. You have the fastest dropping poverty and inequality rates in the region. The sort of really massive educational reforms that were put in place are um, showing real results as well. So like educational inequality is falling massively with people from poorer backgrounds finishing high school, having access to higher education. You've got sort of a huge surge in people's access to health care and schools. And on top of that, you've got a country that is both politically and economically stable. I mean, the IMF actually predicted a recession in 2015 that didn't materialise. And so that really shows that the economy is growing in strength and the country is doing pretty well. So what kind of lessons do you think we can take away from eight years of Korea's government? Um, I think one massive one is invest in social and economic infrastructure. It's one of the biggest levers uh, we have for making big change happen. I think the fundamental point is that there is a role for the state, both in determining the economic policies and ensuring social inclusion. And this has become a very old fashioned idea in Britain. The second point is that economics and politics are really two sides of the same coin. What's really going on here is is a battle for power. Putting this uh, economic model into action has been uh, been rough. There's actually like huge political and economic interest uh, when you try to move from a model that was very functional to private, large private interests. You're trying to move into a model that Uh, sort of things more about the people, the majority of people in the country, it's been very rough. And so this battle's never over. It's ongoing in a democracy. It doesn't finish. And so we're only part way through the Ecuadorian story in that sense. So I think the main lesson for me is that um, Ecuador shows that there are places where inequality is dropping, where energy is becoming cleaner, where democratic participation is actually increasing. So it really shows that it's actually possible. So the Ecuadorian story is still unfolding, but our story here has come to an end. We've heard a lot about a little country that is trying to do things differently, transforming its economy while dealing with pretty visible struggles for power, trying to get off oil uh, while reducing inequality. These are many of the issues that we talk about every single week at the Weekly Economics Podcast, live in action. 
Jackie Howard from Compass, Dan Bockins from the New Economics Foundation. Thanks so much for being our guinea pigs and thanks so much for taking the time out to help us tell such an interesting economic story like the one you've just told about Ecuador. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks, it's been amazing. So this was a really uh, mammoth project uh, for the weekly economics podcast team. So I'd like to thank James and Hugh for taking so many extra hours um, to bring this project together and make it something that sounds really super special. Uh, Next week, we'll be back with uh, the usual thing, another economics expert talking about something dead good. So we'll see you there. (laughs) The weekly economics podcast is brought to you by the New Economics Foundation an independent think tank and charity that campaigns for a fairer, sustainable economy. Find out more and get involved at neweconomics.org. Na, 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 na. You know it? No. Oh. <laughs>